Hi, in this video, I will be talking about white blood cells, what they do, and what it means if your white blood cells are low. But first, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this channel. And of course, you can go to yerba.com to get your personalized report. So I'm going to talk next about different types of cells in the bone marrow. What is the bone marrow? The bone marrow is sort of the juice inside our long bones. So we have bone marrow inside our thighs, we have it in our, um, in our pelvis, in our spine, we have bone marrow in our ribs, in our breastbone, really in all of the, many of the bones. Not every single bone has bone marrow, but there's bone marrow inside our bones, and that's sort of a factory for making different types of cells. Specifically, today we'll be talking about white blood cells, but I do want to mention that we also make red blood cells and we also make platelets. Red blood cells carry oxygen. When red blood cells are low, that's called anemia. Platelets are tiny little cells that help us clot, and when platelets are low, that's called thrombocytopenia. Today, I'm going to be focusing on white blood cells. White blood cells do a whole host of things. White blood cells in general fight infection, and there are some white blood cells that also affect our body's ability to fight cancer and other more serious infections like fungal infections. This is all part of our immune system, which includes not only white blood cells, but the spleen and our lymph nodes as well. White blood cells are made very quickly by the bone marrow and then released into the bloodstream. And the type of cell I'm going to be talking about specifically today are called neutrophils. And neutrophils are the ones that are affected most by cancer treatment. And these are the cells that fight bacterial infections, not viruses, uh, not fungal infections. I'd love you to think about the immune system like a maple tree. If you can picture a maple tree in your mind's eye, you can imagine there are many different sizes of branches. There are the huge boughs that come off the trunk, and then there are the smaller branches. The immune system is like a big tree with lots of boughs and branches, and then even some tiny little branches at the end. The part of the immune system that's affected by, I'll talk specifically about chemotherapy, is a pretty small branch. It's a branch on which you might hang a bird feeder or a swing, but you certainly wouldn't hang a two-seater swinging bench. So it's just really a smaller branch on the tree. The rest of your immune system during chemotherapy in particular is left intact. It's not affected. So your body is able to fight viruses. It's able to still fight cancer. It's able to do all the other things that your immune system does for you. The part that can get sort of dented, if you will, is the part that fights bacteria. So what does this mean for you? So if you're on, I'll start with chemotherapy, but I'll also talk about radiation, targeted therapy, and even surgery. Uh, the part of the immune system affected is the part that fights bacteria, and this can happen usually seven to 10 days after chemotherapy, and then your bone marrow will get back to making the same number of white cells it did before. What this means is when chemotherapy is all over, you finished all the rounds of chemotherapy you're supposed to get, your immune system rebounds. Very rarely do people continue to have low white blood cells cell counts after the conclusion of all of their chemotherapy. I've seen it probably in two or three patients out of the over a thousand patients I've treated. So after chemotherapy, you are not immune suppressed, but during chemotherapy, you are slightly immune suppressed. I mentioned that seven to 10 days after chemotherapy, I'm gonna use my hand to show you the white cells come down and then they come back up. During that period, when they are at the lowest, is when you are considered at higher risk for bacterial infections. Where do bacterial infections come from? They actually come from our own body. We have bacteria all the way from our mouth, all the way down to the anus. Our whole body is full of really, for the most part, good bacteria. They help keep the fungus and yeast at bay. They make vitamins. Bacteria are really good, but we don't want to 
uh, have those bacteria introduced into our blood system, into our bloodstream. So if you're on chemotherapy and you have inflammation of the mouth or all the way down the GI tract, bacteria from, your, from the mouth all the way through can enter into the bloodstream. That's the way we become infected with bacteria is through our own bodies. It's uncommon for people to catch a bacterial infection from somebody else. Now there is an exception to this bacteria mainly. We know that during the COVID pandemic, that people whose white cell counts were very low were at risk for worse outcomes from COVID, a virus. It's also the case that those people tended to be more frail. So it's hard to know if it was exactly COVID itself or all the other things that went upon, along with having neutropenia, low neutrophil counts. Penia is the Greek for few. So neutro is neutrophil and penia is few. So few neutrophils is neutropenia. So back to the bacterial infection. So anything that can introduce bacteria into the bloodstream, like vigorous flossing or even uh, dental cleaning. Dental cleanings introduce a lot more bacteria into our bloodstream than dental work, like uh, filling a cavity or doing a root canal, surprisingly. If you floss and you haven't flossed before, that's a time during which bacteria can enter into the bloodstream. I don't recommend you start, stop flossing. I actually recommend that you start because gum disease is a big risk factor for bloodstream infections. So before you even start chemotherapy, get your teeth cleaned at the dentist when your white cell counts are normal and start flossing. Good oral hygiene is important. You'll want to not be harsh on your gums. You'll want to use a soft toothbrush, but we should all be doing that regardless of whether or not we are on chemotherapy. Other things that can introduce um, infection into the bloodstream are if you have an, a port under the skin and sterile procedures are violated. So you want to take really good care of your port. We've talked about this in other videos. Um, you'll also notice that when you have your blood drawn, that, that betadine or alcohol are used so that bacteria don't from your skin get introduced into your bloodstream. Other things, uh, terrible diarrhea um, can cause, even if you don't have colitis, it can cause inflammation of the GI tract and that can lead to some problems, so can constipation. So you'll want to monitor your bowel movements and let your medical team know. Now, even if, you're back, even if your white cell counts are low, you still can fight infection. So it's not like you are at terrible risk and you don't have to stay away from crowds. What you wanna do is stay away from sick people. And I'll tell you why, even though you're not a greater risk of a viral infection, let's say you get a viral infection and you have a fever. Well, I don't know that you have a viral infection. You could just as well have a bacterial infection. So if you get a fever and when you're on chemotherapy and your counts are low, we have to treat you as if you have a bacterial infection, even if we can't find one. So we go you know, full core press on evaluating you and treating you as if you have a bacterial infection when it could just be a cold. So that's the reason we have you stay away from crowds, not because you're going to get a bacterial infection from other people. That's actually pretty uncommon, though of course we know, you know, some, one of my team members has strep throat and so does her little son. So we know that can happen, but that's not the main way people get infected from uh, when their white cell counts are low. What can we do to increase white cell counts? Well, if you're on dose-dense therapy where you're getting chemotherapy very close together, it's not the closeness together that makes us give you a shot to boost your white cell counts. It's so you can stay on schedule. So if you're on chemotherapy every two weeks, it's very likely that you will get a white cell booster or a granulocyte colony stimulating factor. We do have a video about this. If you have a problem after one cycle with um, an infection and you're not on every two week therapy, let's say you're on every three week therapy, we may give you growth factor shots, which don't make you grow tall. They boost your white cell counts to be produced more by the marrow. We may give you a growth factor shot after your chemotherapy so that we reduce the risk of you having a bloodstream infection the second time. People who are older, 
um, are more likely to have, um, it's a more tired bone marrow. So people who are older are more likely to need to have a white cell booster given to them after their first cycle, if for example, they have an infection. We don't generally give preventative growth factors unless the chemotherapy regimen is known to cause low white cell count. So we don't give it with all chemotherapy. We give it when we know people are likely or they're at reasonable risk to try to prevent that. What happens once you have a fever and a low white cell count? Giving growth factors actually doesn't improve your outcome. It's sort of too late. We'll give it the next cycle. We do give it to people who have serious bloodstream infection with low blood pressure and high heart rate and they're really sick in the hospital or with people who have pneumonia. So I mentioned that you can have low white blood counts with other types of treatment. So surgery actually affects our natural killer cells, which fight cancers, more than chemotherapy, which is kind of interesting. This tends not to lead to clinically significant differences in outcome, but it's just in something interesting to know. Usually the neutrophils and other white cell counts, if they go down during surgery because the body is recruiting all those cells for healing, they come back up fairly quickly. Radiation therapy can cause low white blood cell counts if we're radiating a part of the body that has a lot of bone marrow. So if, for example, you're getting radiation therapy to the pelvis because there's cancer in the pelvis, you can see white blood cell counts get lower. Same thing with the long bones of the leg and sometimes the spine. If we're radiating you know, a larger area of the spine, we can see white blood cell counts go low. And that's because the bone marrow is affected uh, by the radiation just as the cancer is affected. Uh, but again, this is pretty uncommon. It's rare for us to have to delay or hold off on giving radiation therapy because of low white blood cell counts. And when people are getting radiation through the breast and the neighboring lymph nodes, we don't even have to check your blood work. Some targeted therapy can cause low white blood cell counts, in particular the CDK inhibitors. These we've covered in another video. These we give to people who have metastatic or advanced disease, and even in some people who have what we think is curative treatment, but they're particularly high risk of recurrence. These drugs can cause a low white blood cell count, in which case we usually alter the dose or the frequency with which you take the medicine. We might give you two weeks in a row and two weeks off, as opposed to two weeks in a row and one week off. But usually we'll lower the dose a little bit. I have to say that happens in most of my patients. So it's a really common side effect. We'll link to that video below so you can learn more about these drugs. They're only used in people whose tumors are estrogen receptor positive and they're, or progesterone receptor positive, and they're also used with endocrine therapy. Yeah. So I've covered a lot in this video. I hope it's been helpful. Uh, white cells are just one part of your body, but they're an important part, and you will hear a lot about your white cells when you're going through treatment. I've given you some tips on what you can do, what might increase your risk, thoughts on you know wearing a mask out in public, avoiding crowds, not as important, though it can help prevent viral infections. If this has been helpful to you, click like because that'll help other people looking for this information find it. Don't forget to subscribe. You can follow us on Instagram and drop a comment or a question below. I try to get back to everyone within a week or two at the most. Thanks for watching.